um, I welcome you, the Garden Community Church, one more time. Um, as you know, we as a church have been looking at different things in God's perspective. So we looked at sin, we looked at God's relationship to us, and um, that leads us to what Matthew and I will be looking at today, which is the relationship between believers or members in the body of Christ in God's perspective. So wanting to be a part of a group is a normal part of human identity, right? We all want to be a part of something. So you find, you'll find that people join uh, social media groups, people join book clubs, people join golf clubs, people go join sailing clubs, people join associations, and all of these things just so they can meet people who are similar to them, who have like uh, similar interests, or who are like-minded. And searching for a sense of belonging People join groups throughout their life, or people are part of groups or identify with groups throughout their life. First, you start out by being a member of your family, and then probably as you go to school, you're part of a sport team, or you're part of a band, or you might put your identity in your friend group, or you might even put your identity in your ethnic culture. And I want to ask you this, do you know anyone who is healthy, happy, and isolated. Anybody? <laughs> and see, we we struggle. We don't function that way, right? We to find somebody who's healthy and happy and isolated. I don't, I don't know anyone who's healthy and happy and isolated. We as human beings are born with the need for social interactions. We thrive that way, we function that way. We need social interactions to be healthy, physically as well as emotionally. And that's why sometimes we'll even find that introverts or people who are not so social like some of us are, have their own thing where they don't have to be very you know, social, but they have to be a little social and so they can have their own kind of fellowship and their own kind of interactions with people. So I want to ask you this. Have you heard the saying where it says that we all, human beings, have a God-shaped vacuum in our heart? Have you heard that? A God-shaped vacuum? See, I believe this is actually true and I also believe that this is where our need for the social interaction with another human being or the need for belonging comes out of that particular God-shaped vacuum. And what I also believe that is that this particular need to belong is the deeper longing to be a part of God's family is to be a part of the body of Christ. Do you know what the phrase body of Christ means? Does anyone know what that means, body of Christ? Church. Anything else? Well, it means two things. One, the actual or the literal body of Christ, right? And number two, like C said, the church. It tells us in Colossians 1 and verse 24, as well as 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, that the body of Christ is the church. Okay? It means the literal body of Christ as well as the church. So it doesn't, when you say church, it doesn't mean the community center, okay? This is, the community center is not the body of Christ, but all of us members together, collectively, the church, that church, is what the body of Christ also means. And we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, For as the body is one and had many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also in Christ. I'll, I'll explain that for you. I know, that's kind of tricky, right? This is very simple. What this verse is actually telling us is the characteristics of the body of Christ, right? It's telling us that the body of Christ or the church has many members, right? We are many. We're not just one. We're many members. But it's also telling us that all of us together are one or we are united in Christ. How cool, right? And... Like I said before, there are so many groups around us that we can be a part of, 
okay? But I want to let you in on a little secret. There is one ultimate membership or there's one ultimate group that we can all be a part of. Do you know what that is? The body of Christ. And do you know what the requirement is to be a part of the body of Christ? Faith in Jesus. That's the only requirement that the Bible tells us that we need to be a part of the body of Christ. So, so you know what the best group to be a part of is? Do you, you know how to be a part of that group? Now, how are you to be, right? No, even in this world, when we join different groups, there are certain decorums that we need to follow. There are certain rules that we need to follow. And so like that, as believers, as members who are part of this body of Christ, there are certain things that we need to do. And so we're going to look at that four aspects of that today, four different things that we're going to look at. Number one is love one another. We read in John chapter 13, verse 34, John 13, verse 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And it goes on in John 13, verse 35, it says, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciple if you love one another. See, what we're reading here is that Jesus is telling us that he is giving us a new commandment here. He's giving us a new commandment and telling us that you have to love one another. You have to love your brother or sister that's sitting here. Not just here, outside as well, but let's talk about church, right? We are to love of our brother and sister that's sitting next to us exactly the way God loves you. It's easy to love people with condition, but God loves us unconditionally. So that's how God wants you to love your brother and sister. And, and the interesting part is Jesus goes on to say that just by the way you love your brother or your sister, People could look at that and know that you are God's disciple. How could that be, right? How could you loving your brother and sister in Christ tell the people outside of church that you are God's disciple? But that's what God is telling us. Now we know that loving others is obviously a big deal. It's a, one of the greatest commandments in Christianity. And it's a crucial element as well in Christianity. But how do we do it? What is this love all about? We know, like I said, unconditional love and all these things. Like, but what is this love, right? The world tells us what love is. Hollywood tells us what love is. But do you know what the scripture tells us about love? I'd like to turn your attention to 1 Corinthians 13 from verse 4 to 8. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 to 8. And I believe a lot of you know this. Let's read this. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. That's a long list. Actually, Apostle Paul is describing 15 different characteristics, 15 different characteristics of love that should be present between a brother and sister in the body of Christ. So I want to look into a few of these characteristics with you. Number one is being patient with one another. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2 also reminds us of this. It says, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Ephesians 4 verse 2. And with like, like any other commandment in the Bible, I believe that repetition is a signpost to importance, right? And even as parents, we repeat something to our kids. Like I still have to repeat things with Anaya. She's not even 11 months, right? Some things that are very important, you have to repeat it again and again. And I think that's what the Bible is telling us by telling us to be patient in loving others. That's very important. 
But let's be honest, being patient is not easy. I mean, no matter how many years you've been in Christ, being patient is difficult. Especially patient love. Patient love is choosing to love someone when you don't feel like it. Patient love is choosing to love someone when they do not deserve it. Right? But this is the kind of God love that God has for us. Are we deserving of his love always? No, I'm not. At least I'm not. But he still loves us. Paul also talks about being kind. That love is kind and compassionate, right? Ephesians 4 verse 32 also says, Be kind and compassionate to one another. And the word kindness in the Bible is talking about kindness of your heart. Let's be honest, in the world that we live in now, we're not kind to people. You make a mistake, you're canceled. You're not worth it anymore. But love that is kind is hard to find. That's the love that God wants you to show. Love that is kind has goodness in the center of it. This is how God is with us, right? Not, not saying that God does rebuke us. God does rebuke us. But he has kindness and goodness at the center of his heart along with love. Another way to love is to be devoted and to honor one another. Romans 12 and verse 10 we read, Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. And in a different version, in ESV, it actually uses the term brotherly affection. What does devotion look like? Are you devoted to anyone in your life? Are you? Yeah? Devotion is being committed to someone, is being there for someone, is being loyal to someone, it's being loving to someone, right? And if we're actually looking, these qualities are very common if you look between you and your siblings, right? You're committed to them, you're loyal to them, you're, you're there for them, you're loving, you're all of these things. And it's, sometimes we say that it's easy to have that between your siblings. But what God wants, us, wants from us is to, for us to have this with our brothers and sisters in Christ. God wants us to love our brothers and sisters in Christ with devotion and by honoring one another. See, we all know that we have to love one another. We do, right? We all know that. But honestly, what happen, what's happening in church is that we sometimes get jealous of our brother or sister when they receive praise or when they receive recognition or when they receive some sort of blessing that we don't have. There's a lot of resentment that comes in us as well. And if we're being honest, churches have been destroyed because of this, because we are not capable of the love that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians. It's a long list, I agree. But I think we should strive, that we should always strive to outdo one another in loving. I encourage you to read those verses and to look through those verses and, and really see, am, am I loving my brother and sister like this? Because it is one of the greatest commandments that God is asking of us. So Matthew will do number two. Uh, second point in relation to um, between the God's relationship, God, what God wants in relationship between believers is unity. How many of you know the word? Um, how many of you know the meaning of the word unity? 
together, isn't it? Together, yeah, that's right. Oneness. Oneness, yes. So the, the word mean the, the word unity means joint as a whole. The relationship between believers in regards to unity is a crucial aspect of our Christian fellowship. And unity among us is not just a merry concept. It's actually a powerful reality that's been strongly and like it's reality that's been emphasized throughout the Bible for strong and healthy Christian community. One of the things, you know, um, that comes to my mind when I hear the word unity is, um, is about my mom. When myself and my brother used to fight a lot, you know, she used to just fight and she used to, uh, during the evening prayer, she calls together and she used to read this psalm, especially it's Psalm 133 words 1. So Psalm 133 words 1, it says, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. The old psalm actually, you know, um, it actually emphasizes the beauty and blessing of unity among God's people. And, and the other thing that she used to say, and my mom used to say, is, uh, is the story from uh, Exodus. So Exodus chapter 17, words um, 11, 12, um, 13, if you can read the words and you, know, you all know the story. It's a story uh, about a war between Israelites and Amalekites. So, so the story, I'm not going to read the whole scripture, so the story basically is there's a, there's a war between Israelites and Amalekites. And Moses goes up to the mountains. He raises his hands and prays. When Moses' hands were held up high, the Israelites were prevailing in the battle. And as a human being, you all know, how long can you hold up your hand held high and pray? For me, it's less than three minutes. And so that's, 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 that's and so, you know, and I need help. So you can see, in, in, you can see the Bible, and if the fight went on for hours, that's what the audience said, the fight went on for hours. And, and all that time, Moses, you know, had his hands held up high. And you can see two people, Aaron and Hur, came alongside Moses. It doesn't say, you know, um, they walked together, like they came alongside. So when people came alongside, so when, when another believer comes along with another believer, what happens is it shows unity among them. It shows, you know, their visions are one. It shows, you know, uh, that they both have a same idea, their goal is same. So, and you can see, uh, you can, when you read the scripture, you can see that Aaron and her roll up a stone for Moses so that he can sit. And they hold, what, like each of them hold, hold his hands so that Israel prevail in battle. So this actually shows the power of unity and support in times of spiritual difficulties or, or in spiritual battle also or spiritual warfare, whatever you can call, you can say, uh, say that in 1 Corinthians 12 words, 12 and 13, actually Sharon mentioned that words uh, a couple of minutes ago, but I, I would like to read that words one more time. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12 words, 12, 13 and 14. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one Spirit. So we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we are all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. And in Romans 12, verse 4 to 5, you know, Paul actually mention, mentions the same thing in a different way. You know, basically these words, uh, what it says is that when we unite in faith, love and humility, we become part of one body in Christ. And this unity goes beyond our difference, our ethnic or our culture, 
our social differences. And, you know, and it helps us in binding us together in the common purposes of glorifying God. So, and um, Philippians uh, chapter 2, words 1 to 5, let's read together Philippians chapter 2, words 1 to 5. So Paul writes us to like, us to like that. So therefore, I, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in Spirit and, and of one mind. Do not do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility value others above yourself. In Galatians chapter 6 words 2, you know, it actually says about carrying each other's burden. That's also a part of, you know, unity. It's a part of, you know, unity that shows, you know, your brotherly love is still there. You believe it's still there. In Colossians also in 13, 3 words 13 to 14, it's, it tells us to forgive. And if you read the words about uh, 13 and 14, it says about kindness, humility, and to be like Christ-minded. So in our journey of faith, we are called to love one another and serve each other with humility. And we are also, uh, we should bear each other's burden in times of difficulties or in times of pain, in times of um, rejoice. You know, as we read before, I mean, we are different parts. We form together to be part of one body. And there might be conflicts on, between us. So as, as in Colossians it says, you know, forgive others. Conflicts may arise between us. But we are encouraged to forgive one another and, uh, and pursue reconciliation. As Christians, our, our unity is not just for our own sake, but also serves as a powerful testimony to the world. And one of the examples that I like about this is the like story about the wall of Jericho being fell down. So th that story happened, you know, about 2,000 years ago. And why do we still say that story? Why do we still quote that example? Because it shows unity among the believers. It, show, it showed unity among the Israelites. They prayed together. They walked together. And well, when, when, they, uh, when they prayed together, you know, all the, the, the enemy's plan went down. And it became a testimony. It became a testimony so that you know, we are telling about what happened 2,000 years back or more. We are telling it now. In, John, in the New Testament, in John chapter 17, verse 20 to 23, if you're reading, you can see Jesus actually prayed for our unity. Jesus actually prayed for our unity, knowing it would reveal the reality of message to the world. So when we cherish the gift of unity and strive to maintain it, we'll be a shining light that draws others to Him. And third point is serve and shine. So the third thing about the relationship between believers that we're going to look at is serving one another. Do you know what the word service means? Anyone? I'll tell you. Service by definition is actually the action of helping or doing some sort of work for somebody else. It could be showing kindness or even favor to another person. It could be helping someone or assisting someone that just needs a little help. And for us Christians, the word service is not something we actually do, but something that becomes second nature to us. Right? People in this world choose to do some sort of service. But for us Christians, as we accept Christ and live a life honoring to God, serving becomes our second nature. And Jesus is actually our ultimate example for service, right? How did Jesus serve us? 
He came to this earth. He gave us his life. He died on this cross. He lived his entire life for us. That's the ultimate example of service that we have. And all of us Christians are called to serve every single day. From the moment you wake up till the moment you sleep, you are called to serve. How? I don't know. It can be different. You could be serving your family. You could be doing these different things for your family members. But when we're looking at how to serve the body of Christ or the fellow members, we have some examples from Jesus that I want to quote today. From James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, talks about praying for each other, right? And Jesus, actually, in John chapter 17, we read about how he prayed for his disciples as well as all the believers. And even when he was on the cross, he prayed for the people that hurt him. He prayed for the people that put him on that cross. That's one of the ways that you can serve. Another way is by showing hospitality. Even Jesus did it, right? He welcomed the tax collectors. He welcomed the sinners. He welcomed women. He welcomed Samaritans. He showed hospitality to these people. And even now, even now, he's a God that shows hospitality to us. And anyone outside of this building that wants to come to Christ, God is hospitable to those people. Another way is encouraging and comforting one another. Jesus did that, right? We read in John chapter 16, verse 33, it says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace in the world. You In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome this world. Jesus is encouraging us. And exactly like this, we are called to encourage and to comfort one another. The Lord wants us as Christians to be there for each other. This, sometimes, I mean, if we're being honest, I'm not so good at comforting people. Do you know what to tell someone when someone they love has passed away? Let's be honest. I don't. I just go there just like, Lord, give me something. Something that I can tell them that will comfort them. But see, Jesus is someone that was never in short of words to comfort people. I encourage you to rely on him. See, in um, in 1 Peter, let me get that verse. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. We have all been given different gifts. Right? We've all been given different gifts. And if you don't know your gift, I encourage you to find your gift. Spend time with God asking Him, God, what is the gift that you have given me? And I encourage you to use those gifts to encourage one another, to comfort one another, to show hospitality, to pray. There are many ways where you can serve the body of Christ. Always be on the lookout for how you can serve your brother or sister in Christ. The fourth point that we want to touch is uh, the relationship believer, between believers in relation to teaching. So the relationship between believers and the church uh, in regards to teaching is rooted in the biblical principles of discipleship, unity, and mutual edification. So let's explore these uh, principles with the relevant Bible verses. So in Matthew, uh, let's read Matthew chapter 28, words 19 to 20. How many of you know these words? Matthew chapter 28, words 19. It's, all, it's, it's, it's mainly known as the Great Commission. Uh, the, the, uh, so that particular word is 
commonly called as the Great Commission that God given us to go and speak to all the nations. So let's read Matthew chapter 28, words 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now Jesus actually commissions his disciples to go and make more disciples, teaching them to observe all that he had commanded. So the, the verse highlights the importance of believers being engaged in teaching each other, mentoring each other, passing on the teaching of Jesus and helping them to grow in their faith. And the second principle is unity. In Ephesians chapter 4, words 3, it's written, um, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is, a, who is over all and through all in all. Apostle Paul emphasizes you know, um, the significance of unity among believers grounded in the essential truths of Christian faith. But the passage actually stresses more uh, the importance of believers being united in faith, despite you know, there are differences among them. As I mentioned before, we might be from different cultural or ethnic backgrounds, and, but we are all one in Christ. So the unity of believers is a powerful witness to the world and reflects the oneness of the body of Christ. The third principle is mutual edification. In 1 Thessalonians 5 words 11, Paul encourages believers to edify and build up one another. When you read the, when you read the words, you can actually understand is that you know, Paul actually say, you know, says the responsibility of believers to support others and uplift each other in terms of teaching, encouragement, or sharing of their faith experiences. So, you know, in our, in our journey of faith, let us embrace and call to teach and learn among believers through mutual edification and discipleship. We can grow together in, uh, we can grow together in God's word, becoming a united community that impacts the world of, for Christ. As, as you said in John chapter 17, verse 22 to 3, you know, when you're united, you become a testimony to the world. As we encourage and build one another, let us shine as beacons of God's love, empowering each other to make a lasting difference. And together we can walk together, hand in hand, nurturing growth and transforming life through the power of God. So, my question to you is, how are, we do, uh, how are we doing in terms of these aspects that we have discussed today? Is our relationship with other believers a reflection of God's perspective? You know, is our relationship with other believers in reflection of God's perspective like love, serve, unity, and teaching, are we doing it? Are we having any issues with anyone? So let's take a moment to evaluate our relationship, and let's um, let's take a moment and let's evaluate our ourselves with these aspects that we discussed today. <laughs>